Okay. So I actually am being very brave tonight using Zoom for, I think, my first time um, to do this. So thank you so much to all of you who are joining. I'm really excited to do this with Esther. This is like something that we've wanted to do. Esther, for whatever reason, the way it's working right now is if I'm unmuted, you're muted, whatever it is, we're going to unmute you in a second. Um, Basically, this is a live that's going to address hopefully some of the questions related to um, people who have lost a parent as a child or teen and may have been through um, some sort of trauma and loss and grief and how to talk to their own kids about sort of grief and loss and trauma without creating certainly new trauma. So that's pretty much that. I'm going to get off. You're going to get on. Esther, I think you are the host currently. Just see if that works for you. And if so. Yeah, yeah. tell me if you can hear me. Um, one second, I'm gonna mute. Sorry, Esther, I don't know if you heard me, but when I make you a host, you got to start because you won't be no able problem. to hear me. No problem. Okay. okay so I'm, I'm just wondering. If, okay, one second. Are we going to be able to communicate, you and I, or will you have to keep going on and off of mute? Okay, go ahead. I said, okay. Um, so, Rifka, I was asking if you would be able to um, unmute yourself because if there's going to be any question and answers or back and forth, I just want to check. Yes. If you're going to be able to go, okay, okay. So do you want me to just introduce myself or do you want me to hop in on um, my thoughts? Where do you want me to start? Um, hmm. Okay. Just start. <laughs> Can I just start? You know, I actually saw a quote and I also, I know there were some questions that you and I spoke about, about um, first just addressing like what the experience of losing a parent is like when, you know, how that impacts being a parent right now. Maybe first just talking about, you know, how that loss, how that change changes um, each of you or any of you as parents. And then um, talking about, you know, how the trauma was dealt with um, impacts you. And then kind of talk, then we'll could segue into some of the other questions, kind of, you know, what are the clues that you might have some trauma symptoms or that something's being kicked up when the concept of death comes up? How do you know that you're in a good space? And then talking about how to work with um, children or children or your children when the topic of death and loss comes up. Can we go there? Let's just start there. Okay. One second. Okay. Just go. Okay. Want me to you want me to start? Let's talk. <laughs> Are you there? Yeah, but I'm helpless. Okay. So put me? me back on. I'm just I'm just gonna have a conversation with myself. Put me okay. back on. Do you hear me? Uh, yes, I hear you now. Oh, so now we both hear each other. That's great. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so stay on. So stay okay. on. And do you have the chat box? Because I'm trying to just eat. Oh, here we go. I just wanted to mention to people that we're actually gonna change yes. it right now to make sure that the chats are going just to hmm. I think it's set to go just one second to host only. Well, you could just ask some people to put in a message and then we'll I'm see where it goes. So do, like, right. Yeah. Wait, can you just write test? Can somebody just write test? Okay. And it's just showing up to me. Is it showing up to you, um, Esther? I'm just curious. Yes, it's showing up to me. So did okay, anybody great. message you? So it's, yeah, yeah. I'm getting a bunch okay. of tests. Hi, right. Are you seeing that? Yeah. No, okay. I don't see that. Actually, it's all coming to you. So okay, you're going to read. Okay, because that's the way we okay. actually wanted it perfect. originally. Okay. Is that Esther, you keep talking and I'm going to monitor it. And if there's any question that comes up or if anybody has any question, I'll interrupt you. And yes, the questions are coming just to the host and it's set to me for one reason or another. 
Um, so that's the way we're going to do it. So I think Esther, yeah, now that everybody could hear me, do give some basic introduction to yourself um, and your <laughs> a little bit clinical background. And then I think we'll go into some of the questions also that we discussed a little bit that had come up that people wanted to know a little bit more about. Yeah, okay, so my name is Esther Goldstein. I'm super excited to be on here, super grateful and humble to know Sarif Kakon. I'm not here to um, sing your praises, but I'm grateful to know about you, the organization. Um, my clinical background really is, I'm a social worker um, and I specialize in treating trauma. And one of the big elements of trauma, and, and when it means that I specialize in it, it just means that I'm a humble human being who has um, done a lot of um, learning as a person and as a professional. And I've really been committed to helping people find relief and really find um, meaning from and through the pain that they've gone through. And of course, one of the ways that we suffer through pain um, is by the experience of loss. And one of the ways that we experience loss is by the experience of death or, um, you know, and that's deeply connected to grief. Um, and so I'm grateful to be on here um, just because I want to talk about like one of the things that I'm passionate about, which is about like when we are parents, when we're raising our own children, you know, as a mom, I can appreciate the specific struggles that might come up when we want to be whole and steady as ourselves and also in parenting our children. Um, and so a little bit about me. I mean, I have a practice in the five towns of Long Island. Um, I work primarily with adults. I am a big believer that um, almost all symptoms um, have a reason. They're the way that the mind and the body are communicating with us. And so if anyone's on here um, who is in pain or suffering, I just wanna say like my heart feels with yours and I'm hopeful that some of these words can resonate or connect with you in some way so that you feel a bit more hopeful. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so look, I, I've gotten to know some of Esther's work in, in trauma, which is kind of why I brought you on here once this topic um, came up. So I want to jump in. There were a couple, I'm just looking at my screen because there were a couple of new questions coming in. Also, I just want to be yeah. mindful of all of this. Yeah. And here's where we're going to start. So I think one of the first things, let me just go up here. Okay. So I think one of the first things we wanted to discuss, because some people had this, is how does my experience with death, and, and just by way of background, my name is Sarah Kakon. I run an organization called Links and Schleimies Club for kids and teens who lost a parent. Um, I do want to put this out there is that if you are a parent of a child who who has lost a parent or if you are a family dealing with young children who have lost a parent, we certainly um, are here to be able to do our best to provide as much support as we can emotionally to these children so that they can hopefully become the amazing adults that we know they are and the amazing children that we know they are. Um, so how does our experience with the death of a parent or you know, a significant death in our own childhood affect how we, um, how we look at death perhaps and how we, view, how we view death. And I think the follow-up question that this person had was how does the way the trauma was dealt with or the death was dealt with play into that effect? Like, is it different if somebody you know is in a different place like if the trauma was dealt with differently will the reaction to that death be different yeah okay so i'm going to answer to the best of my ability i know there's so many different like ways to go about this but um very briefly you said like how does the impact right so if i've been through a death before um how will that possibly impact the way that i'm experiencing or seeing death right now and then the second piece is, um, does the way that the death was dealt with or the way the trauma was dealt with impact me or how does it impact me, right? So um, I think the experience of death or the experience of losing someone incredibly significant in your life um, in your younger years impacts you on many, many levels. Um, it's gonna impact you obviously emotionally on a psychological level and also like on a physiological level. You know, it changes the way that the brain is processing information about itself, about the world. Like when we're in our developing years, and that could be very young, and we'll talk about that soon, um, to even like um, to different ages and phases of life, we're really, we're always trying to make sense of who am I? Um, where do I have a sense of control? And um, how do I understand the people around me and the world around me? So um, death is going to impact you. And it's almost like a twofold answer because the way that the death was experienced, so depending on the age that you experience the death, sometimes your brain gets almost um, stuck in the way that it's um, understanding death later on in life. So for example, if you were like a 12-year-old 
um, and then you experience death, and then right now you're a 40 year old, what's happening is that if the, if the trauma wasn't processed properly, which means if there wasn't um, a supportive person who helped you make sense of it in an age appropriate kind of way, if there wasn't proper supports, um, and I think a lot of deaths, people try their best, but sometimes there are a lot of losses or there isn't enough support or, or that you might have done a lot of work, but there's still kind of pieces that weren't fully digested on your brain and body level. What might happen is that when death's spoken about right now, your body might revert to like that 12 year old who's processing death. So you might have some symptoms um, or you might experience the word or the experience of death um, almost like you are back at the time or back at the age that you were when you experienced death or deaths in your life, if there were different deaths at different times in your life. So that's just one piece. That's more of like, if, if sometimes I'll see someone has a very strong reaction, um, almost disproportionate to the age that they're in, but because there's almost like an emotional flashback, which means like the body and the emotions are having almost a reminder of the age that that experience happened. I think also death can be experienced differently in the sense of like some part of you might be like, oh, death, like this is a familiar story. Like, welcome to my life, you know, like growing up, like there was like, you know, toys and dolls and books and friends and death, like death's just part of your vocabulary. So that might be almost like there's a familiarity to it. There might be almost like a cynicism of like, okay, yeah, welcome to the world of like the non-living. Um, there might also be like a hypersensitivity because it really depends on how you process that loss. So some people almost become incredibly more vulnerable, incredibly more um, sensitive, feeling a bit more helpless and hopeless, and almost like they're not sure where they fit in, in the world and in who they are. So I guess all of this ties back to the way that the death impacted you, how you understood death as a child or as whatever age it was when the loss happened. Um, and the second piece is also just like how it was processed, because you might have um, not fully understood it, but over the years you processed it, and that right now the way that you're experiencing death or the way you're processing it will be different based on that. You know, so even if it wasn't fully processed back then, but if you did some work, um, it will be different right now. Wow. Okay. So that's, that's a lot. And I think there's, there's a lot there that's going to lead um, into the next, sorry, into the next piece, which is, I, and I just want to answer, somebody just asked a question in, yeah. in the box related to this. She said, well, what if somebody was a toddler who really had no understanding of the fact that there was a death? Um, what then? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's a good question. So I think that there's this piece of, based on the age of the child, um, that there's definitely an impact. Um, so I think that when it comes to a toddler, a toddler knows that there's change. A toddler knows that there's a shift, even if um, the toddler doesn't fully understand because they can't like cognitively understand the changes. Um, but there is um, a body, a felt sense experience. One of the pieces that I work with a lot is clients who have like anxiety or depression. And sometimes there's something called like a preverbal trauma or like um, where it's basically that the body has an experience of change, of loss, of trauma, um, but they don't have like the working, the words or the experience um, in a way that they can understand it yet. But the body remembers. It's actually a book called The Body Remembers. The body keeps the score. The body happy keeps to give score. Yeah. Here. Yeah, exactly. So, so honestly, the body knows that there's a loss. The child knows because A, the people around him or her are, are impacted and there's grief in the air. There is an energetic shift. And the body also knows just because, you know, if it was mommy or Tati or Bobby or Zaidi or an aunt or an uncle, whoever it is, or um, the body knows like that there's a certain level of like physical contact, there's a certain kind of warmth, a certain kind of familiarity, certain conversations. Um, so the body feels the shift. Now, if you're asking the question, will the person experience it the same way? No, you're going to hear if the death was experienced when you're a toddler versus when you were a teenager, your body might not process it in the same way. So it's processed somewhere unconscious or on your body and not necessarily on your mind. And sometimes later when we're an adult and we have a child around the age that we were, let's say if we were a toddler, when you had that loss, you might have like funny symptoms or different triggers, or right now it might be something might be coming up when your children are saying things and suddenly you're like, I don't know why this feels weird. Um, so that sometimes when it comes up, it, it might not be part of your narrative that you experienced the loss. You might be like, I don't, I don't know, it was a loss. I was a baby. I was little. Um, but it impacts you. The impact might just be different and the memory is going to be stored differently. Got it. Wow. Um, and that book, The Body Keeps Score, Bessel van der Kolk, is, is a phenomenal, phenomenal stuff. Um, I think we'll go back to some somatic work later in terms of, because yeah. a couple of people asked things related to that. 
what might be clues, um, somebody was asking earlier, what might be clues that you are experiencing trauma when speaking about death? Like, maybe I'm fine. Maybe when, or maybe I did good work, right? And maybe like now, unfortunately, if a neighbor dies or a grandparent dies and I'm talking to a child about this, I feel like I'm okay, but maybe I'm not. <laughs> like, how do we, how do we know if it's just our voice in our head challenging us or if there's something really not okay there? Okay. I'm just going to define okay and not okay differently right now. So differently right now, A, just because it's a pandemic mm -hmm. and differently right just because um, there are deaths and we're kind of exposed to that more and there's so many changes in terms of our family structures and things like that. Um, so, so, so being okay right now or being okay with the experience of loss would be like if we look at this, there's a concept called the window of tolerance. Um, and it basically just means that like sometimes we're feeling like if there was basically a window, right? So above the window is when I'm like very anxious or very nervous or like very agitated or very on guard and jump at everything and yelling at everyone, right? And, and, and then under the window was like, I'm completely depressed, I'm numb, I'm not engaged. People, like my kid will talk to me, I'll be like, what? Yeah, I don't know, whatever, do whatever you want. Just completely like spaced out and disconnected. Then the place where you're healthy, so this is, a, this is above the window of tolerance, right? This is the window. So if you're above or below, then you're not really in such a good space, okay? And where we want you to be is in this window. In this window, the way we know that you're in the window is when you could think and feel at the same time. Okay, so what that's going to look like is I'm having... think and feel, you said at the same time? Yeah, okay. well, you can think and feel at the same time. So, like, I'm thinking my neighbor just died. Oh, death. I'm feeling this, like, disappointment or this pang, but I'm able to still be, like, engaged. Like, I can feel the emotions, right? I might, like, be, you know, the lower level is just, like, sad, depressed, um, shame, guilt, there's just different emotions, but it's more of like a downer. And the upper window is just like anxious. So even if I'm feeling a little anxious, or I might be hanging out much more on the lower end, like during the day, I'm feeling more blah, but I'm still in this window, right? Because I can think and I could feel at the same time. So like I could think about something my kid is saying to me, I can understand what my husband is asking, and I could feel my feelings at the same time. That means that you're okay. Even if this is a little rockier, right? Even if let's say you're more towards the anxious side or a little bit more towards like the depressed or sad side these days um so, so let me just pause that for a second because i'm seeing yeah. like the the question box is blowing up um and yeah. i think this is like a key piece um you know some people are are, are just writing is that, that they're they're kind of like missing something one person wrote can you explain this in a little bit more simple language yeah i feel let's like th let's go back on this on this window piece because i think this is an important like ground like kind of the, the, the um, foundational work to what we're going to talk about a little bit more here, right? So basically what you're saying is to know when somebody is an active trauma, sort of, would you say? Yeah. Or, yeah. right? When they're talking about something would be when they have a hard time being able to hold two things at once. Exactly. And that would be the thinking and the feeling. So I think what yes. you're saying, if I understood correctly, and this is a little bit of a new concept to me with these words, but I think conceptually I'm getting where you're going, is that what you want to be able to say is you get a horrible piece of news while you're sitting at your kid's birthday party, you can still have the birthday party and understand that for this six-year-old needs mommy right now to cut the cake but I can still be feeling these kinds of feelings. Are we saying we can have like sort of two conflicting stuff going on for us? Is that what you're saying? That kind of being able? That's part of it. I mean, that would be a piece of it. Um, what it means is if I could just go on that is like, basically if I'm only feeling right, let's say, let's just split it for a second. So if I'm only feeling, that means like I get this news or um, I get this news or, and then all what's happening is that I'm spiraling in sadness or I'm spiraling in panic. And I'm just kind of like, I just got taken over and I'm just completely in only a feeling, a feeling of panic, a feeling of just deadness, the feeling of just sadness, the feeling of like shock, right? So just completely only in the feeling state, right? Or if you talk about the birthday party, I get this news. Um, and so, and it doesn't only have to do with death. I guess, honestly, I look at this for anybody when people ask if they're okay. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes I look at this, it's kind of like, is it that when there's an emotion that it almost like completely overtakes you that you can't be connected to the here and now? So it is that concept of doing both, 
right? Because the thinking is mm-hmm. that your brain is still is still on, right? Some people have the opposite where they're not feeling anything, but their brain just starts kind of running, right? All they're doing is thinking and they're just not able to feel anything. So if if any of those happen, like if you have like either or, and I don't mean just like for 10, 15 minutes. This is more of like an indicator for like a period of time, right? When, when you say a period of time, I'm just curious, what do you call a period of time? Um, okay. So that's what I'm saying. I guess like with coronavirus, if let's say someone is for the first time home with like their delicious bunch of kids and there's a lot going on and they're just really overwhelmed, I would just want to separate like the situational reality from like, let's say the trauma reality of what's going on, right? So if somebody hears about a death, and what's happening is that they're feeling this very intense, heavy um, feeling that lasts for like, um, I, don't, I would say like 10, 15 minutes, but then throughout the day, they have a feeling of sadness, but they're still able to, you know, get dressed. They're still able to like make breakfast. They're still able to listen to their kids, not to the same level that they would have, but there's still that level of like being able to think and engage and still feeling like that's still a level of functioning. If they feel like they're incredibly more agitated and their feelings are overtaking them or their thinking is happening on a much, much, much lower level of functioning and they can't get things done, um, then that's where I would say, uh, and a window of time would be even like a, a few days, I would say, um, then I would, wonder, I would start wondering. But it really depends on a case-by-case basis, you know? Like I think it depends. I would want to hear more about the specifics of, because somebody could go like just one day, like this level of functioning is very frightening for them, right? They're suddenly having a trauma reaction to hearing about death. And I would say like, um, if this is even happening for a day, then you want to get some information about what's going on. Um, Reach out to someone or first understand what's happening that your body is going through this. Doesn't mean that suddenly you're a mess, but it might mean that your body's needing some help in processing whatever's going on around you. Okay, so I want to just go back up now to a couple of other questions that came in. Um, And we are going to jump a little bit through some of what you have and some of the questions because we will be going back and forth. We do want to be addressing what's going on. Okay, so one question here. How to deal with the loss if it happened to you as a teen, right? I think she says 14, 15, and it was shoved aside at the time. Now this man is a father and older and he wants to deal with it. He says, okay, I get that. Um, How do we? how do we go with it? Like, where does one even begin with that if one does want, does want to have a healthier way of being able to communicate with our children in terms of death, trauma, or even just really be able to communicate, period, in this kind of state? Okay. So to that person, first of all, I commend you, um, this person who wants to do the work. I find that any parents that are cognizant enough or are aware of you know, how their own lives have impacted them and then how it impacts their children. I really like respect that because I think when we do our work, we are much more wholesome people. Look, I think the first question would be like getting to know yourself as a person and the part of you that experienced that loss. So if there's like a 13, 14 year old inside of you, right? Um, If we, you know, we all talk about like, there's a common concept that's called like an inner child. Um, but I would say more specifically, like the inner orphan or like the, the child inside of you that experienced the loss. Mm-hmm. I think the first piece would just be getting to know that part, especially if it was shoved away. Um, sometimes getting to know like, what was it like for that 13, 14 year old you? Like if you got to visit that part of you, what do you imagine it would be like if he got to see you? What would he want to say to you? Or what would, um, what kind of emotions do you imagine that child was or wasn't feeling, you know, he, you, this teenage. I I, I want to just pause for a second and say each of those questions can be minefields that I could see several sessions in therapy and answering one of those questions. Because I think that what you're hitting on is that when we are dealing with work as adults for trauma or death or grief that was unresolved in childhood, what we're looking at certainly is opening up something huge that has been shoved. I I do want to say that I think in my experience, and I don't know, Esther, if you've seen this, but I think it, first of all, it needs to be tight rated. Um, And the the way I explain that to people is that that's like a seltzer bottle that you don't want to open the cap all at once and allow everything to go spraying. So it's not like any therapist worth their weight or worth their salt would take 
a client one day who ha is dealing now with no, the trauma no. of everything. Yes, yes. And and because uh, I see people saying this is so scary. No, if if you were to start therapy right now, no, it's not like in session one. We're opening up all these questions no. and we're going everywhere. What I think Esther is saying is that the direction in in which healing will happen is in being able to explore what it is that went in for you as a child went on inside and therefore how that a plays out right now right like for some people it's as you alluded to having a child the same age can be highly triggering for some people it becomes the knowledge that there's a certain inability to connect with either their spouse or their children out of either fear that look everybody i loved in my life tends to die so why really get close to anyone they're going to die anyway and and i have to say that this is a horrible thought to have to live with every day and people really do struggle with that it's very real um i think what we want to look at is that when all these questions get explored in therapy like esther started saying and there is inner child work there's somatic therapy there's so many different ways that it can be done in a gentle form in a tight rated way where it's slowly we're going to work on this slowly slowly to be able to deal with this so that it's not you know it doesn't kind of mess with like somebody said i'm terrified of going to therapy because it's going to mess with my life now right exactly yeah. the point yeah, I think when you asked the question, when you said the question, I think my in my mind I was thinking like, wait, hold on, this is like a therapy question, and um, like I think that there's a there's a technical question of what can I do in real time, and then there's a mm -hmm. therapy question. I'm so grateful that you kind of said what you did and jumped on me, and you're like, wait one second, <laughs> no, I wouldn't say like sit down and start doing this. I think when if if the person is asking that, I would just say that the work is basically when we want to be more wholesome parents. I think it's more of exactly what you said, the worries or the fears. Um, and to the people who are afraid of starting therapy, good therapy never dives you in right away into stuff that are intense. It's really first about actually noticing the strengths and your resilience and your capacity to be the person who you are today. Um, and then it would go with like a certain theme. So if you want to be able to feel more connected, if you want to be able to feel more um, alive or more um, comfortable talking to your children about concepts like life or death, because like life and death is a concept like if we're alive then we know that there's a concept of death as well but it's the emotional intensity um it's the emotional um explanation that we give it which makes us have big emotions so mm -hmm. for example you know so it's almost like sometimes when i meant to comment on that guy i did not mean to prescribe a therapy session but like <laughs> what i meant is that sometimes we have like First of all, the world at large has a fear response, which is normal, right? It's like we don't always get feedback, or most of us, right? We don't get feedback from the people in the world um, of, of not the physical living anymore. Like they're not in pain. I think one of the big pieces is that like it's not, it doesn't hurt to be dead. And so sometimes like people, like we, we're hurting, right? We're the ones who are hurting over here. Um, so there's just that alone as a society and as people in the world. And then there is there's the pain of being the person who was left. And I think that that would be a place to just like notice it. You do not have to start exploring it. Just like acknowledge, like, you know what? There was a pain that I went through um, mm -hmm. and I've built a beautiful life or I've built a life and sometimes I have a pain and a strong emotion. And um, I think even just giving it space, like, cause there was that, that person who mentioned, like if it was shoved away, I think like, I know that there was a loss in my family and I remember someone said like, oh, like he's much better. Like he's in the best place in the world. And I was like, yay, when can I see him? And it was like a few days later, it was like, he's in Shemayim with the Malachim. And it's like, what, you know? So, but I think, and then, but I think there's a piece of just even like making sense of like, wow, you know what? Like death impacted me and without having to go into all the demons or the emotions, but it impacted me. And slowly over time, like um, in good therapy or even just understanding like the concept of death and how it might have um, formed you into who you are, first of all, into like a deeper or more attentive person of who you are. Um, but now what might be happening is that there might just be some emotions that are being kicked up and then how to look at them maybe almost differently because I forgot where it was. There was a quote that said something like someone wrote like um, parenting gave me, I didn't never knew parenting would give me the opportunity to heal some of my own inner wounds. So sometimes like our children almost push us to look at some of our own selves, not in a scary way, but like wow, if you can find a way to talk about death with your child or your children in a way that can actually feel healthy and solid, it could almost be like a healing experience for your own self. 
like mm-hmm. to watch yourself do that and to provide something more wholesome for your children than what, than what you might've gotten. Beautiful. Um, I'll actually just share this for a second before we move on to the next question is that it took me years to put up a picture of my mother. My mother passed away when I was nine to put up a picture of my mother on my fridge was a very difficult thing because I was petrified of what my kids were going to ask me in relation to it. I Meaning say, if they were going to see this picture, who is this person? They all knew my mother passed away. My oldest daughter is named for her. Um, but it was like, if I would have to verbalize that, um, it was going to be challenging. And what was interesting is I was doing this simultaneously to speaking everywhere about death. And I want to say that as a point of validating is that sometimes, and and somebody just pointed this out, I'm really comfortable throwing around the word death or dying. Why can't I talk to my kids about it? Our kids touch something much deeper within us. And oftentimes because they are the children who are roughly the same age we were, or oftentimes because there is something, the bond between a parent and a child is completely different. So while I could get up in an audience of 500 people and describe and probably give the best prescription for how to speak to your kids about death, it took years till that picture went up and I was able to be casual and comfortable that at the worst time possible, because you know your kids do it at the worst time, at the worst time possible, the kid will pass the fridge and go, how old were you? And you're like, how old were you what? How old were you when your mother was nifter? And I'm like, really now, right? And of course we don't wanna be able to answer that way. So, but I found that what was fascinating is that the more comfortable I was able to get in answering these kind of questions with my body completely comfortable and my soul completely comfortable, it, it, it definitely, it transforms you as a person. And, and definitely, you know, if what you said resonated. Okay, um, I wanna just jump to one other question here. What if you experienced death as a teenager and now as a mother of your kids, when you hear all about the deaths, you feel like it's normal, like it goes right over your head and you almost give off the feeling that you don't seem to care. Um, and I think yeah. this is a reality, like you pointed to the cynicism almost in the beginning of like, yeah, I've seen death. So sorry. It was another one, but like, there's a piece of a person that can become that way. Um, I think that what happens is that like when we have big emotions, wait, first of all, I, I love what you said, by the way, and thanks for your honesty and transparency about like the piece of being able to be like a public figure or kind of giving, educating people. And then also in the intimacy of your own home, having such a different emotional experience. I just want to say this for anyone who like, we have different parts of ourselves and it's completely normal if you're comfortable talking about these kinds of topics. And then when it comes to your child or when it comes to right? Something else. It's so much more sensitive. It's so much more sensitive when it comes, and it could even be more scary, right? Like so much more sensitive when it comes to your own work. And I wouldn't say to push yourself or to expect yourself to be that quote unquote expert teacher, educator with your own family. Like you're allowed to be like in lane number one and to be going like 10 miles an hour or five miles an hour at your own pace with your own family, talking about things that are sensitive in nature, even if out there in the world, you're speeding on like a racetrack. I just have to say that because so many times people almost see the difference between like, I'm doing this in my personal life or when it comes to this, I feel like such a baby. And it's like, you're not a baby. This is how you need right now when you're processing it. Um, The person who's like a little bit like, oh, it doesn't taint them. um, You know, it's hard to say without knowing you personally, but sometimes like what happens when like death is a big thing, right? It impacts us. And my sense is that maybe when you went through death um, as a teenager, first of all, like sometimes there's almost this piece of like trying to develop a sense of autonomy of like, who am I? Trying to understand Hashem, understanding the world. Um, So some people might go to feeling very sensitive and might blame themselves or feel a burden. And some other people go more to like protective, like they're almost wearing like this armor of like, I don't care, or like, it doesn't impact me so much. And it, either of them are really just protective. It's your body trying to say like, I got this, I'm fine. Even the worst, horriblest, biggest thing in, in the world or something that big is not going to impact me. And I'm going to develop an incredible resilience and incredible strength to just be okay. So that's my sense. If you're having like, almost like you seem almost not care, almost like blase of like, oh, okay, whatever. Yeah. Like somebody died. Oh, you want chocolate milk for breakfast? It could just be that there's that protective part of you right it's almost like if you imagine almost like a soldier that's like standing there right next to you like oh okay like you know doesn't get too close or too intensely connected to 
um, the concept of death. It could also be, right, it doesn't have to be this extreme. It could also be that there's a certain familiarity that it's like, okay, this is my territory. I've been here before. Like the world is just coming. I think I wrote an article actually about trauma and how some people feel like, well, I've dealt with this, right? Like, welcome to mm -hmm. my world. Mm -hmm. So that must be like, well, I've been here before. Like now the world's visiting my land of loss. Okay. You know, so it really depends on the person's experience. I also am getting curious about her question, like, does it bother her? Like, does she seem heartless or cold? Or is she just trying to understand why she's not being so incredibly impacted? Um, or is just impacted in a different way? Mm -hmm. I would be curious to know more. Yeah. Okay. So there's another question here. How do I actually tell my kids, though, about death? And she writes in parentheses, my kids range between two and seven. But I think the truth is that you and I discussed that we did want to come up with the basic parameters for kids of different ages what the best way is. And I think one thing that I think we may have touched on is obviously it's gonna be very different if this is a death of somebody who they barely knew in shul versus somebody who was an uncle for argument's sake who they saw very often or the neighbor upstairs, right? It, it, it's gonna play out a little bit differently. I don't know if you wanna make that differentiation in some of what you explain, but just know that obviously kids will be affected usually very differently dependent on the relationship. And also what I'm finding is that depending on their personality, I mean, there are kids who are just naturally more sensitive types. And I think you probably yes. see that in your practice. And those kids somehow, there's actually one mother who just wrote, she goes, it gets me nervous that my kids are so sensitive. And, mm -hmm. you know, we have okay. different types of personalities and, oh, she's continuing. She says, every death in town seems to totally shut them. So what she's saying is she feels like it's not a death that seems to be at least close by and she's not, you know, perhaps due to her own losses and grief earlier on in her life, she's not falling apart, so to speak. And she's kind of wondering, is it normal that my kid is completely sensitive about every death they read about anywhere? Um. I, get, I actually get curious about what her experience was about the death that she experienced. Um, was like, I'm curious about the way that she's coped. Is it normal that her children are taking it very seriously or is it normal that she feels like she can't deal with it? Is that what's happening here? I don't know. We'll find out if she comes back to the question box. <laughs> I think there was this piece. I think, I think somebody had written earlier like that she can't cope. Look, I think sometimes our kids have very, very, very strong emotions. And we've found a way to deal with that reality in a very specific, exquisite way that's right for us. And so if there's a child that has a much stronger reaction, like I'm just going to talk like basic. If let's say I'm more of like an even healed person and I have like a very sensitive um, anxious, more highly anxious child, that's going to be a challenge for me, okay? Um, and so I'm going to have to really get to understand my child's world so much more than I ever did if I want to be a good parent, right? And we all want to be good parents. Um, but I think specific to death, it could just be like some part of you that knows about death, like for many years, it's kind of like I found a way to cope, right? Sometimes you'll find this actually, right? You probably would know about this better than me, but let's say with trauma, people who've been through trauma or people have been through loss or people have been through death, it's almost like it's almost like you've had to develop a certain level of coping skills. And when your child almost seems like to cry over things that are mundane or not a big deal, you're almost like, what? Like get with the system. Like, why don't you have the same skills I do? But you have to become an expert at coping skills in a way that your kids might not have to, hopefully. Um, so I think when it comes to this, it's just, it might be too much for you that you're feeling like, oh my God, again, like this is so exhausting. Um, I wonder if it would be an opportunity for you to get to understand why they're panicking. What's the story that they have in their head about death? Because um, maybe we'll talk a little bit about the age ranges. And it really depends, obviously, within the age ranges about what they understand. Because, mm -hmm. um, because I think talking to this mother's um, children, and then we'll talk about the age ranges. I think that um, younger children who are hearing certain things or they're sensing certain things, like you hear, you see all these videos or little kids talking about coronavirus or talking about death or talking about things. So I almost feel like the younger children are hearing more than we would maybe want them to. And at the same time, they actually need to understand a little bit about what's going on, especially if they're impacted. Um, I think the kids who are repetitive, if you look at the scientific data, the children who are repetitive, usually you'll see this like under the age six. Um, 
because like zero, one, two, they do not understand even three, four, like they don't understand the concept of like, um, like people dying. They'll think that someone's going to come back when, you know, when's Bobby coming back or when's our neighbor going to come visit? Oh, she went away. When is she coming back? Um, but let's say up to the age, like six, I would even say seven, the repetitive questions is that the child has not fully understood the concept. And actually the repetition is actually what's going to help them understand it. So um, although it might be annoying as a parent, it's actually very age appropriate that the child is asking again and again, because it's almost like they were given a piece of meat that's too heavy or too big for them to chew. And they're, they keep chewing it because they're just like, Wait, what happened? Who died? That is oh my God, such a happened? beautiful example because that's a perfect analogy um, to something that I can't say you know, I had, I, I could make sense of, but that's perfect. It's like when you have something that's too big and you've got to just somehow make it, you know, chew that information. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that even just for parents to understand, like, I think that, um, I think for parents to understand that like your child is actually acting and being very normal, like there's nothing wrong with your child and everybody's children are acting very differently. My own self as a person, like I see myself as a mom, but I'm also hearing from different people from the professional front and also from my personal front and family front, like different people's children are really um, acting differently. A lot of children are regressing in terms of some of the progress that they've made or some of the struggles that they've mm -hmm. had or even like right with, with nightmares. Um, but the repetition I'm hearing a lot from parents and really it's that the child's asking for help. So if you could almost like if the child asked you like, wait, mommy, like where is the bathroom again? Or like, <coughs> mommy, say mm -hmm. your kid just learned how to reach and get his like cereal bowl. Like, mommy, how do I get there? Where's the step stool? Like almost see if you could digest it in your own brain as like, your child's just trying to integrate a new piece of the world or of the reality into his or her head. And he's going to get it. The child's going to get it at some point. Um, but like, and it's as difficult as this is, the more patient and the, and if you could just repeat like the same few sentences um, at a certain point and even understand that like, you know what, it might not fully click it right now or this week, but like at some point the child's going to digest it enough for it to settle down. Because if every new piece of information is, is getting the kid agitated, my sense is that, yeah, it hasn't fully digested yet and they're kind of needing some help. Okay, so let's go through just quickly in the interest of time and then I do want to yeah. make time for more questions. I mean, this you have yeah. to see this inbox. So hmm. let's just go through preschool. Adele, okay. what do you, uh, let's talk about what's the earliest age we talk to kids about death? I think it depends on... I would probably say, I mean, I think it depends. I would even talk to like, it depends on the age because I've seen like very young, like two, three, four year olds who are like, where is Bobby, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so you just say like, um, I would say that like if you, the, the biggest thing is that you use the language that it is. Now with mm -hmm. young children, you might say like, Bobby is not here anymore. Bobby died or whatever use your word, like word you use or nifter. Um, then I would basically use some very, very, very basic language. And you talk about like, um, um, dying just means that the body doesn't work anymore, right? Like you just want to, I, even, I think two, three, four is young. I think it really depends on the child. I'm only saying this because I know of like a three-year-old who kept asking about like a Bobby who she saw a lot, a lot, a lot. Sometimes the child goes more into like a spaced out zone, but I would say anywhere from like, um, like but the child- Certainly yeah. older toddler to preschool. What I yeah, think I would, you're, what you're saying is just keep it very simple, but very clear. I liked your thing about like the, the body stopped working. Um, we did do actually with a preschooler now who had a very close relative, you know, we took a shoe box okay. and it actually was putting the doll in the shoe box. And she said, that's where the body went in a box in the earth because she had certain images in terms of that. And then and then we were able to describe that the neshama goes to shamayim and the body goes yeah. on the earth and they separate and that's it. And we don't see this person anymore. So I get a lot of pushback when I say that of, one second, we believe in Tchiyas HaMesim, we believe in Mashiach. What are you telling a child? You don't see the person anymore. So what I always For explain, right. yes. I, I always explain this because I feel this is such a critical piece here. For the child who has a very limited capacity at that age, and young children really, really do, they cannot understand a lot of um, things that are abstract. 
it is almost impossible. The abstract mind doesn't work at that age. And so I always feel we will add that information as it comes. And yes, if a child asks you, so Bobby's going to come back when Mashiach comes, of course we answer yes. But for a child who's three, four, or five, sometimes leaving first layer one of information that is not the be all and end all. Chalila v'chas. I am not in any way saying that we leave out part two. What I am saying is it's not the right time. I have seen so many kids get confused because here's the sentiment that they sometimes get. Um, so Bobby was nifter, or this aunt was nifter, this neighbor was nifter, and they're going to come back soon when Mashiach comes. So here's what happens. This child hears the word soon, doesn't know what Mashiach is, and lives like this every morning. You talk about repetition. This is repetition on steroids. And nothing settles because I'm not ready to settle. So that's right. You're almost like, you're almost keeping the child. You're almost like hanging the child. You're almost right. hanging like a lollipop in front of the kid. And actually what it does to the nervous system, which is like the brain and the body is that you're like, you're, you're triggering it every single day. Right. And so I can understand, like, I'm so grateful you're bringing this up because I can understand the discomfort. I love that you just described the imagery of the girl. Cause I was going to say for young children, there's actually less words. It would be more of like this, depending mm -hmm. on what they need. Um, but it would be more of like, yeah, like, let's say we'll just say like Bobby is, is um, not with us anymore. She died. Dying means this, right? Like her body stopped working, right? Like, um, and even like what you're saying, I think with children, a lot of times like play. So it's almost like the adult might say like, this is what happens. And sometimes draw kind of like what an Ashama might look or feel like, or like, let's say that there's a whole world in Shamayim um, and she's like very happy and it's cozy and it's nice. Um, but that this is, we won't see her right now. There needs to be a finality to it because or else you're leaving the child with constantly like looking outside the window. And then Correct. there's almost like magical thinking. And it's like, if I dove in hard enough, if I pray, if I say the right thing, if I do the right thing, like what's going to happen. And it's, the body never really gets to settle the loss and, and, and it's going to settle over time. Exactly. I mean, there was one, like, sometimes I think for children who are even a little older, if you want to explain that the body stopped working, like you could just say, you know, like when someone dies, um, the body stops, right? The inside, everything inside the body stops, the heart stops and the breathing stops and they don't eat or go to the bathroom anymore. And the thinking and the feeling stops too. Um, but it doesn't hurt to be dead. Like you just go through like all mm -hmm. the basic, you know, like, Right. Um, Some, sometimes for children, it's interesting, parents don't think about it, but they get very little in terms of their thoughts. And they get sometimes yeah. annoyingly imaginative in their questions. To adults, it can be sometimes like, really? That's what you right. want to know? Yeah, that's what they want to know. That's what they're holding on to. So let's move for a second. So we know preschool, we want to be as clear. I would say that's, that's pretty much, this is the language I would use certainly up to about age six, seven comfortably. Yes. Um, there is yeah. also, by the way, a phenomenal book. I want people to know about this for young kids. It's called I Lost Someone Special. I just actually did a video on it also. It is a book that I gave out about 20 copies of now during this coronavirus um, thing. I am out of copies right now, but you can order it through Hefer Lumde Mishnah or Amazon. Um, basically, it's a book written by Bracha Getz, and it very much addresses the from child who loses someone special. And what I love about it is that there's not any particular person mentioned in the story. So it can be a grandmother, it can be an aunt, it could be a cousin, it could be the neighbor, it could be the candy man in the shul. Um, and it, it uses such beautiful words to really clarify things. Um, I know that class from High Lifeline really wrote a beautiful recommendation for it, and I, I had seen it before as well. And I think one of the things that I tell parents sometimes is if you, for whatever reason, are not in a comfortable space, going back to what people say in the beginning, and I certainly know this to have been true for me, books can be wonderful. Because when we right. don't know how to use the right words with our children, if somebody actually went to the trouble to do the work for us, sometimes that's what we need in the moment. And this book has been wonderful for many families. Right. It's almost like lean on that. I think mm -hmm. there's something about giving. So I was just going to say, like, I think there's giving a narrative. So kind of talking mm -hmm. about like somebody died. I think the other piece is just like um, giving an emotion to it. It depends on the age, but I would say like it, mommy feels sad or mom, or like when somebody is not with us anymore, when somebody dies, it's normal to have many different kinds of feelings. Um, 
like how, and, and sometimes you might use like a feeling chart or just be like, how are you feeling? Or what's it like to know this now? Mm -hmm. um, and the kid might say, I don't feel anything. And it's like, okay, but like if at any time, like something comes up, like it's so normal. I mean, it depends on the age, obviously, but kind mm -hmm. of like you want to, you want to make space for the fact that there's emotions, let them know that you're having emotions about this loss mm -hmm. too. Cause a child could be like my favorite, you know, cousin who read me bedtime stories whenever she babysat, you know? So so if you're not having an emotional reaction, like they could get confused, even if they're young. Um, I think it's also important to talk about like, what does this mean? What does this mean for like planning for the future? What this means is that next Hanukkah party, Blank is not going to be there, right? Um, and like when it comes to, and this is, this is actually for a little older children, but I think even with younger children, you're not going to have this conversation, but you're going to plan for it. So if let's say mm -hmm. the next birthday party or Hanukkah party, little Hanalah, um, usually likes her cousin and you told her like she's not here anymore you're going to want to prepare either like being more aware or being more emotionally mm -hmm. sensitive that if she's feeling a bit moody or agitated or angry like there's the reason for that her body is trying to process what just changed when it's an older child I would talk about like what does this mean what's happening next I might talk about I mean now with coronavirus it's a little different but talking about like the facts, making space for emotions, how this is impacting you, how it might impact them. Um, I would give information in doses, like you said, like very basic information over time, they can ask for more. We never mm -hmm. overfeed our children to the point where they're like, I can't, mm -hmm. you know, you give them very basic information and you kind of milk the information slowly um, as each kid, it's appropriate for them. But I think there's something about like talking about what's going to happen next because a lot of people feel like, okay, like there's this concept of death and I am alive right now. And then what does that mean for me? Like, what are we doing about this person? Like, how do we give them a space on this world still? Or if they're in Shemayim, what does that mean, right? If they're in heaven. And I think the other piece is also like, how do you let them know how to live a life after there's death, right? I mean, maybe you were going to talk about that, just like structure, routine. So do you want to go into the next phase? Next. So phase I think let's, structure? yeah, let's talk about, let's go through the ages. We have, I just want to be mindful that we have about 10 to 15 minutes left. We okay. do about like, hundred questions which we're not going to go through but okay. unfortunately but we're going to try I'm, I'm i'm reading them as they come in so that i'm trying to consolidate as much as i can so if i don't say your specific question i'm going to try to pick something that is similar enough that i believe the answer should be able to answer both so i'm just apologizing in advance honestly i didn't know how how loaded the questions were going to be and just how how much we want it but i do want to run through very quickly just in a nutshell elementary age kids you know let's take the 8 to 12 range something like that okay i think that then when you're going to that eight, that age range they're starting to understand more about the world i think that they're going to have more questions uh, magical thinking is more like i mentioned is around the age mm -hmm. of four but you're sometimes going to have depending on the relationship children who feel like they could have done something different or they feel responsible and so you'll see that in a child where they feel like incredibly burdened or they feel like they have to obsessively start doing things or they are noticing a shift in their behavior. Um, I do want to say also, we won't go through it right now, but when it comes to these ages, you would want to be looking at like, if your child is going through one of the phases of grief, right? There's the five phases of grief. Um, and I, I think that there's something about knowing that with children, if you look at the research, children go through, I'll just say them briefly, but there's like denial, right? Like denying the fact it's not true. This person's not dead. Anger, which is like, I'm really mad. I'm angry at the person for dying. I'm angry at God and Hashem. I'm angry at the people around me, right? I'm angry at myself. Um, there's bargaining. Like, what if we did this? Well, we should have done this. We could have kept the person alive. There's depression, which is real sadness. And then there's acceptance, which doesn't mean that you accept it. It just means that you're actually picking up the pieces and building a life, um, you know, with energy and focus. So children actually, young children usually, um, really harp in like denial and anger and that's very normal so around that age that you just described right and like young elementary um right like 8 to 12 you're going to find sometimes like denial and anger so there's enough of an awareness and there's enough of a cognitive understanding somewhat of the concept of like here and not here um but you might see more complicated understanding they might ask you questions about like hashem about god i think this kicks up for us like we need to actually look at this piece of um what does it mean like what does life mean what does death mean what does it mean that when bad things happen to good people um i think there's something very real about also telling your child like you don't know not that you should say to every one of the questions you don't know but if they ask some real questions like i think there's something very whole about saying like i can feel the pain or i can feel how big this feels for you and i just like i don't have a specific answer right here right now um, but in this moment, I just want you to know, like, I'm, I'm, I feel it with you. Like, this is so big, That's right? That's so beautiful, some, right? 
I think the biggest experience for these children, because some of them are going to want to intellectualize, because I think that part of this is like, when it comes to that age range, so I would say like, can you help them be engaged in some kind of meaning making, right? Somebody earlier sent me this book, um, what's it called? I think it's Grief in a Box or um, talking about like creating like a memory box. Mm -hmm. So almost mm -hmm. like making sense of or or letting them feel some kind of connection that they have some kind of um, autonomy and control of what's happened. So the person is no longer here. Can you still engage in making like the favorite potato kugel? Can you still engage in doing a certain activity? Can mm -hmm. you, um, you know, so I think there's something about either being involved with things that are happening in the family or having a sense of meaning and connection. Um, I do think there's going to be a lot of questions and I would normalize the emotions that are going to come up. Um, and at the same time, I would say like helping the person know that like it's okay if they go through a lot of different tricky emotions and the biggest piece i know this is the concept of attachment is them knowing that you're there because i think trying to shove an answer and a child around that age is mm -hmm. not going to work they need you with them in their and, and then let's just move to teens really quickly yes. okay so teens sometimes what happens is that it really depends but a lot of times teens will turn more to their friends or or no one when they're processing mm -hmm. things like this um, and so they're having a lot of like complicated emotions um, that they either are or are not aware of. So sometimes parents will feel like this is the trickiest zone because suddenly a parent was like, Shana, come shave, hello, let me talk to you about this. Um, I think there's something about like really leaning on your relationship with the teen. So meaning like if you have, a, like I would just say like knowing the relationship that you've worked on having or the most important thing is for them to know that you're there right? So if like mm -hmm. you have a bad relationship and suddenly there's a death, don't suddenly change the way you're parenting. Mm -hmm. Try to be more of a parent who shows up. I think exactly. I think talk about that. I think talking about the details that they know, they know a lot more details about things in the world. And I would assume they know more than less. Like the worst thing is when your teenager finds out information um, from somebody else, from an outside mm -hmm. source that you didn't tell them. And if you told them, it would be a lot better. So if there's right. details going on around about a person's death, like I would actually give them still basic, but I would give them more. They're getting it from you. Let them know they can ask questions. Um, I think expecting different behaviors to come up and not to be phased by them. Not that that's an easy call, but like they're going to be having a lot of emotions. They might have different like thoughts of anxiety, depression. They might start wondering about death. I think the biggest thing is actually being okay to sit with that. Um, mm -hmm. And there's going to be a questions about like Hashem, God, I think all of that is normal. Um, I do have to say there's something about for all the ages, like even the age below this and this one, I think there's something about preparing children for questions, uncomfortable questions people might ask them. Oh, that's the a great one. That, yes, that's a great one because particularly, you know, now within Corona, what we're finding is unfortunately there's a morbid curiosity amongst adults and certainly amongst kids. And sometimes that filter is off. And children definitely need to know how to respond and also need to know, you know, I tell the kids that we work with, I just actually told this to a little kid today, you don't have to answer every question just because it's asked. Um, yeah. And I yeah. also tell them, you know, and I had the parent on the phone and, and the parent reassured the child that even if it's, you know, your upstairs neighbor who is an adult, you don't have to answer that person. You know, you can come ask me to deal with the adults because sometimes you know, there's complex relationships within extended families and stuff of that sort. And, and children need to know that it's okay for them to be able to grieve in their own way and kind of to have one safe adult that they can talk to if there's anything uncomfortable that people are asking them. I want to just yeah. run through um, a couple more questions just because I want to make sure in the interest yes, of time yes, that yes, we cover yes. as much as we can. Um, yes. First of all, just each one quick. My grandfather was very special to us and he just died. I'm bawling all day. Is that traumatizing to my children? You are what all day? Bawling, crying. she said, crying. Yeah. Okay. Um, is that traumatizing to your children? Uh, look, I, uh, um, it's traumatic for your children to know that there's a loss in the family because it's a trauma and it's a loss. And trauma is not a dirty word. It's a fact. Now, the way that you're processing the trauma is that you're crying a lot. Now, I think that there is, it's important for your children to know that you have emotions. If you're bawling all day and you're completely not able to function and your children are aware of it, I would say to you what I tell any of my clients who go through symptoms that are obvious to their children, obviously dependent on the age. But I think there's something about saying like Zaidi, Zaidi, grandpa, whoever it is, just died. And I'm having a hard time with it because I'm really sad. He was so special. Mm -hmm. He meant so much to us. He made the world a brighter place. And I'm doing everything I can 
to help myself. I'm going to be sad for some time. <coughs> I think they need to know that you have emotions. Like mm -hmm. if parents with postpartum or anxiety or depression, I always say like, let your kids know that you're struggling with depression or with chronic sadness right now or very bad anxiety. You need to let them know that you're doing your best. So even just like, so saying you need to acknowledge it. I think say that you're feeling very sad because he was such a special person. There might be other things that are not appropriate for them to know. Like if you had a lot of, uh, you know, unprocessed anger to him, or there's some other emotional components that might be bringing things up. Obviously, don't talk to your kids about that. Um, I think they need to know that you're that this is normal. When people lose people they love, some people feel very sad. It's normal, and you're doing everything you could to help yourself feel sad, and then over time feel more like mommy again. Right, I and I think know knowing that. that last step of like, and eventually mommy will be the mommy again, you know, kind of thing. Like that that piece of like, there is an end to this thing. Otherwise it's yes. like, to some kids, it's very confusing of like, is my mother always going to be that way? Okay. Um, yes. Is it okay to tell my kids who are four to eight that I do not appreciate conversations about Corona or death? Um, I would first ask you like what's happening for you and your children are talking about it. Cause I wonder about like the same way young children will ask repetitive questions or talk repetitively. Like it's almost like teenagers will ask repetitive. Why? Like, why is this happening? Why, why mm -hmm. would Hashem do this? Why would this world? So something's happening inside of you, right? Like if the kids are bothering you, look, here's the thing I would say. I personally believe that you're allowed to set boundaries, obviously like loose boundaries around certain topics. So I would, I would go with it twofold. I would say to your kids, and it depends, one's younger, one's a little, not as young, but still young, okay? I would say like, wow, we're talking awfully a lot about this. Um, is there a question that you have? Or is it such a, like I would actually wanna understand more of why they're talking so much about it. Is it just because they have nothing else interesting to talk about? Then please talk to them about like, I don't know, how many bones elephants have in their body. Or do they have a worry? And then you want to get to the core of the worry, respond to it, and then say like, you know what, let's also like, it's such a big thing going on in the world. Let's, I would almost try to set some kind of like, um, like, um, like diet around the, the cons, the how often this is, this is being spoken about, right? Like, I don't think it's healthy either for children that 24 seven should talk about it, but it sounds like mom in this situation can handle it. And I would first want mom to get curious. What can you not handle? Because my sense is that your kids can't handle something either. And if you could kind of come to them with like a compassion of just being like, what is it that my kids really need? And then how could I fill that need? And then you could set some kind of gentle boundary. That's beautiful. Right? And then, yeah. Okay. One, talk, yeah. another question here. Could there be a problem if the child is a bit of an intense personality, has a bit of an intense personality and is told that the body stopped working? Will he ever go to sleep relaxed that he won't wake up in the morning? That's an excellent question, actually. You know, it's an amazing question. And I think that, look, here's the thing. Children, children um, are going to have nightmares. Some children who are more intense, like you said, are going to have nightmares and are going to have dreams. Now, we can't always control the kind of intrusive images, thoughts, or dreams that they're going to have. But I almost prefer them having dreams about the real thing that's happening than other horrible things that's happening. And I think that, um, to me, the fact that somebody has nightmares is that the body hasn't fully comprehended the concept of death. And you might actually need to explain it to the child so that they can actually fully process it. Like trauma is when something gets stuck in the head and isn't being digested. So to me, that child is, is traumatized by the fact that A, there's the concept of death, and B, that the concept of death happens so close to home, and C, that the reality of death is applicable to all of us, and we don't know when it's going to happen. And so to me, I think that child would need to process like, um, like what the, the possibilities of him dying, which I'm hoping are very small. And so you would kind of need to give him a, a perceived sense of control. Um, but I think he also needs to have a lot of emotional space for processing what he heard about. Um, because, because yes, it makes sense that he will have a hard time. But here's the thing though, that child might have a hard time regardless. So I don't know, um, maybe Sarafka, you have a better way of saying the concept of death to that child. I think it also depends on the child, by the way. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. Right, so um, I think if I, if I yeah. knew I was dealing one-on-one -on -one with an intensely yeah. um, anxious child, I probably would tread carefully with the verbiage. I probably would take consultancy yeah. on how I would do yeah. that. Um, I may also want to do it a little bit in pictures after whatever I tell them. Draw for me what death looks like to you. Draw to me what you think ZID looks like now. Um, very open-ended type of things where nothing is obviously ever critiqued within the image. It's more about giving you insight. And then I think one of the best things I learned in one of the trainings that we took with uh, David Schatzkammer was about 
he said, you know, he once had a kid who drew him a perfect house. And he looked at it and he said, and I could have said, wow, that's a nice house. He said, and I bit my tongue. And I said, so tell me what you draw. It looks like you made a square with a triangle on top. And the kid laughed and he, he said, you know, no, that's a shul, right? He said, I could have missed wow. it because if I would have wow. said, oh, that's a nice house, I would have missed it. So I think that kind of thing is that when we ask a child to draw, draw, what's death look like? And he draws, let's say, black clouds. You might be interpreting that in your head as something devastating. He might just say, it's because I think it's very dark under the earth. And he may not even have a problem with that, right? So we need to be able to give kids a chance to draw and then to tell us a little bit more about what it is that you draw with zero adult assumptions um, in it. Um, so that I might just that be enough. With that. I love that you went with that just to that parent. Like I think with children, that's what I was saying. I think some of it, if you take only a cognitive approach is not going to be enough. Meaning like just saying like, oh, but don't worry, you're not going to die. I think with these children, you're hundred percent right. It would be more of like a play therapy mm -hmm. or art therapy approach where it would be like, it's not about the words. This brain is hyper sensitive mm -hmm. and in process it and then it's gonna I think the symptoms would soften over time as the brain makes sense of it so I love that you brought in that. right and and I think let's be 100% honest and, and fair here with those types of children there may not be another way around it and there may be therapy needed to manage the anxiety because chances are if this child is that anxious that sleep is going to become a, a, a serious I'm not talking about a night or two right a serious chronic issue we may want to be looking at how this child's managing anxiety, period, because there are probably other anxiety right. um, pieces there. Okay. Um, another quick question. I actually think we went through the bulk of them. Oh, somebody commented that the book that you mentioned is called The Memory Box. Um, oh, thank you. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Um, yes. Any ideas to reopen blocked memories that got blocked out? Like when I lost a parent, I don't remember anything from that period of time in my life. Um, I certainly don't remember anything from before that. I don't have any indication on how old the child was, but let's assume it's obviously at a point where memories are more typical for somebody else to have. Like you're not talking about a two-year-old. Oh, there's a new message coming up. Teenager. Okay, right. So we're assuming that this person was a teen and is saying that I have no memories from that part of my life or, you know, prior to that piece. Am I going to be sent to the principal's office again for like giving a therapy answer to a non therapist? Oh, I, I think I think here's the piece. I think I yes. think if I if I could look at this for a second, and this is where I would ask this person a little bit, is there's a lot here about what went on surrounding death, and if I could make one PSA here, a public service announcement, how yeah. we as parents talk to our kids about death and how we deal with the deaths around us which are inevitable, unfortunately, um, affects them. And these questions are just one indicator of what probably went on. My guess is this is not about the death itself. There were circumstances that may have surrounded this death, whether it was the way the adults around wanted this child to perhaps move on way too, way too fast, you know, that I hate the words move on, but, you know, but, but may have projected that kind of feeling. There may have been a culture within the family of like, we don't feel things and people who feel things are weak. People who feel things are judged mm -hmm. in particular mm -hmm. ways. And it culturally, what that does is it, it brings the shame piece in and it brings the piece of like, I learned this is a bad thing to have, so I will shut it. And, and there's no shortcut around this one. There really isn't when we're dealing right. with this sort of right. stuff. Um, but I do find, and I don't know if you see this, at least the vast majority of the adults who lost parents as a child, if they're dealing with something that they haven't looked at in many, many, many years, I suggest that they do try some sort of modality similar, be either somatic experiencing or some sort of art type of thing, because it's going to need to be done in a very creative form when you're trying to open something that's been locked and rusty for many, many, many years. Um, the person saying also it's about the kids and spouse asking for memories from Bubby, but there's a no memory. So that's, that's a whole different piece also is right, that right, right, that right. we could ask. And I have to say there was a Lynx girl recently who shared that she had asked some questions of her extended family about a parent that she didn't have memories of. And it all of a sudden brought so many people out of the woodworks. And I think if you are an aunt to such a child, or if you are a grandparent, or you are a cousin or brother-in-law, and somebody calls you up at random 19 years after this, so if you're an adult and you were a teen, and you call up and say, you know, 
I I'd love to know more about my parent. What was their favorite color? Don't laugh at that as a nonsensical question. It's right. an adult yes. trying to yes. piece together a life that they're missing. And, and really, that's it's such truly one of the most painful pieces when the world knows more about your parent than you do. And, you know, there are just some very good questions out there. Um, there's a book called Always Too Soon. I do not like the book. The book itself is not good. It's worth like buying the for the yeah. appendix in the back for the questions she used in interviewing these people. Those questions you can use in asking extended family or in questioning and digging mm -hmm. to find out a little bit more about that parent. And there's like 70 questions there or something. And they're really good, some of them, in helping you. So if you want that, that's, that's certainly a resource. Um, but I, I would say, just to answer, by the yeah. way, sorry, if I just very briefly, I didn't, I meant like, if the person does want to remember, I just have to say, because there is something very healing and you said mm -hmm. there's no easy way around it. I actually would encourage, right, if the person's ready for like some somatic work or artwork, mm -hmm. I do, your body remembers. And like you said, the, the person might have been pushed to move past it sooner. Your body remembers. And if you do want to remember details that are impacted, I believe that you can and you will with obviously the right support so that the stuff that we're tricky to digest that we're kind of push, pushed away or frozen um, doesn't come up too intensely, but like the good memories do because usually there are some good components. Um, but I think it's beautiful also about reaching out and getting that information like you deserve to know that. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so somebody just wrote here, she goes in, in full caps, she wrote, tell them about the Parsha. And I literally, I forgot about this piece. There was Miriam Lieberman years ago made an impassioned plea that when we get to Parshias like Vayechi, where Yaakov Avinu is talking to his children before he passes away, or when you get to Ahrem Kedashim, where Aharon deals with the deaths of his children, she always said, forget, don't wait until there's a death in there. Use the Parsha as a springboard here and there, and I don't mean on a weekly basis, yeah, right? But yeah. there are so many, the Torah has so many different capacities where discussions about death come up. And in an age-appropriate way, when that becomes a norm, when somebody knows, wow, Yaakovina was alive, he knew yes, he was going to yes. die, he called his children, this is what he said, then he was buried, then his body was taken to earth. So there's so much conversation that's neutral that a kid can handle because our kids are used to Parsha as being part of their mm -hmm. lives. Yeah. And it's such a beautiful way of bringing in. And yes, yeah, somebody says, well, it's this week's Parsha. I was just going to say is, is learn a little bit more about it. Get comfortable with different, you know, we talk a lot about Vayida Maharan, that Aharon was silent, that there's different ways in the Torah that people have dealt with death opening up yeah. your child's mind that there isn't one right way. The Torah talks about many different ways. And these are just beautiful things to throw out at kids, certainly older kids, you know, 11, 12, 13. These can be conversation starters of, of just like getting this type of conversation going that doesn't have to be deeply personal because it's so much easier when we start sometimes with something that's a little bit distant and then hopefully our kids have better tools when it does come up and they can reference that somewhere or a parent can pull that out and be able to reference that in conversation. So yeah, thank you to yeah. the person who reminded me. <laughs> I think it also speaks to the fact that the way that we perceive the world, kind of that's part of this is like when we do our own awareness or our own like healing work or becoming aware of whatever's going on. I think that we're giving the, our children see the world through our eyes. And so like when we just introduce the concept of death and we introduce the concept of whatever it is, right, using the Parsha, um, I think there's something about like, you're just very much um, talking about this as like, okay, you're cultivating an, an uh, ability to be able to interact with all different concepts in the world. Now, how incredible you're creating a child who has like a vast concept and wisdom of the world and is more prepared for a lot of things. So I think a lot of it is the way that we are shifting our relationship to information um, about the world. Right. that we live in. I think yeah. this was unbelievable, Esther. Thank you so much for coming on. There's certainly a lot of interest in topics of adults who dealt with loss as kids. I think there's certainly, this is the beginning of a lot of conversations. I think what we hoped um, to do here is to bring up some more questions, not necessarily resolve them all in the hopes yeah. that everybody will take the journeys that they need to take in order to be able to find hopefully the, the most healing space for them. And really, that, that's all we wish for all of you.
Yeah, I'm grateful for everyone being here. I saw this quote, I actually wanted to share it and then we could wrap up, but I actually resonated um, with me. So I wonder, um, it was this quote by someone named Zoe Clark Coates and um, it says, I know you feel broken, so I won't tell you to have a wonderful day. Instead, I whisper these words to you, just hold on. As the darkest days of grief start to get less, the sun will rise again for you. So I just thought about that because sometimes when someone is going through grief, it's not about pushing them to mm-hmm. have a wonderful day, but just about like holding on and taking one step at a time. And I'm so grateful to be on here and have this conversation with brave people who are committed to really getting more knowledge so you know they can take better care of themselves and their families. Amazing. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who joined. And we'll yeah. let you know once the recording is up in our session. Thank you. Okie dokes.